people ask how we feel when we kind of see um, similar brands. But ultimately, Brandon wanted to change the industry. He wanted to bring more fairness, more transparency. Um, and when we see similar brands coming out, ultimately, they're doing that as well. So it's it's a good thing, I think. We're happy to have friends in the category. This is a special announcement for my French audience. Cette interview de Nicolas Kilner, cofondatrice et présidente de DCM, s'est déroulée en anglais. Pour les auditeurs non anglophones, je précise qu'une traduction intégrale est disponible sur le blog beautytoaster.fr. Hi, I'm Chantal Soutarson, a French beauty and wellness journalist. I'm your host on Beauty Toaster, the first French beauty and wellness podcast. If you don't know about the name Decim, which I think is impossible if you're a real beauty addict, at least you've got to know The Ordinary. For this fifth episode in English, I interviewed Nicola Kilner. Nicola co-founded Decim with Brandon Truax back in 2013. After he passed away in January 2019, Nicola was certainly the best person to take over Decim. We recorded exactly one year after the tragic event. But the spirit of Brandon, its vision and its vivid imagination are still there. Throughout our conversation, Nicola talks about DCM and especially about The Ordinary, which was the first game changer in the indie brand phenomenon we are seeing today. We also talk about the need of transparency and some new beauty standards like sustainability and recycling. I really hope you will enjoy our chat. Headphones on. It's beauty test time. Hello, Nicola. Hello. What was Brandon's motivation when he decided to create Decium almost seven years ago? So Decium is from the Latin word for the number 10, and he wanted to build 10 things at once. And I think he kind of had a lot of frustration from people telling him you can't do multiple things at once and he also really wanted to bring everything in-house and he knew the challenges of starting a, a new beauty brand is you don't know the levels of success you, you might be fortunate to receive so he said well actually if we have an umbrella and do multiple different brands each brand could afford its share of our own manufacturing our own lab and um, even take a PR person mm. actually everyone could kind of pay their 10% contribution and we can kind of see what works. Okay. And uh, he started with the chemistry brand, which is a, a body care brand. Is that right? And why body care? So Brandon actually had a non-compete. So he founded Indeed Labs, which was another skincare brand before Decium. And when he left Indeed Labs, he left with a three-year non-compete. So when we started Decium, we weren't allowed to create any facial skincare products, which... Uh, Brandon was obsessed with yeah. skin and facial mm. skin, so it it was very difficult for him. Almost must, must have been of, frustrating. It was very frustrating. So mm. actually, he said, "Look, there's all of these new technologies. Let's put it all into hand and body care." And what was interesting was we had many people using our hand cream on their faces because they knew actually it had so many different anti aging and kind of skin supporting technologies uh, that they used it on their face as well. Okay, and. Uh, What was it like to arrive as an indie brand on the beauty market at that time when there were no, not many beauty startups, uh, no indie brands, and um, when Instagram wasn't as powerful as today to help raise awareness? So I think back then we... UK was actually the first market we tended to, to launch our brands in, even though our head office was in Toronto. And we're very fortunate, that actually, in the UK, the beauty press are very influential, but they're also very open. They actually take the time to educate themselves, to learn what's happening. So they okay. got to know Brandon, they got to know our team, they got to really understand what we were doing. And they really then had this belief in actually our ability as an incubator, our ability as a leader in science. You know, some of them came to visit the lab. And I think actually the initial success was really from kind of the, the UK beauty journalists buying into what we were doing, which then obviously as social became more popular, Instagram became more important, that started to spread further. Okay. And uh, you were there right from the start. Uh, weren't you scared to dive into something so disruptive back in uh, 2013? After all, the CM launched at a time when it was almost impossible to be a game changer. 
think for me it was just excitement and you know Brandon had this infectious personality where you just wanted to be around him and I met him when I was working as a beauty buyer at Boots in the UK and he was at Indeed Labs and I remember from the first meeting just thinking I want to spend more time with this person and even if it, if it doesn't work I know my life will be richer from spending time with someone who who can kind of teach you so many things mm. and yeah never regretted my decision it was the best decision of my life I think joining mm. Brandon and Desiem. And so uh, DCM has its own lab, so you formulate your own products. Uh, what is, why is it so important? So I think for us, it was really about having the control of the whole process. And, um, you know, one of the things different at DCM, so innovation for us actually sits in the lab. So we don't have a brand team coming up with new concepts. It comes from the lab. We believe science is the heart of everything. And I think because we really want to push boundaries, we want to do things differently to others it was important that actually we have control of the whole process so we actually have over 70 people now working in our technical teams uh, we just moved into our new facility in Toronto and um, so we do the whole process from uh, research and development to kind of creating the formulas up to manufacturing all right and uh, this same is an umbrella with uh, about 10 different brands like uh, The Ordinary, Neod, the chemistry brand, Ilamid, and uh, new ones launching uh, very soon, I heard. Uh, each one has its own personality. Can you explain uh, to us the differences between all of them? So The Ordinary, which is, our, um, of course, the, the best-known brand, is really about bringing familiar ingredients and making them accessible and um, you know, it was really born out of, again, probably a lot of frustration where there are some incredible ingredients out there, but they don't need to be expensive. And I always give an example of if you had a headache and you wanted to go and buy some aspirin, you know, aspirin maybe costs three euros. You would never walk into a pharmacy and see aspirin for three euros, 30 euros, 300 yeah, euros. Yeah, of course. In the world of skincare, that did happen, you know familiar ingredients like retinols or different kind of vitamin C serums, you could see at every different price point. And actually it was hard for the consumer to really um, understand if spending more really got them more. So the ordinary kind of said, let's bring clarity to the industry to say, actually, these ingredients, they've been around, they're inexpensive, but they are some of the um, best ingredients in the world of skincare. Neod is probably the crown jewel where I think most of our team are the most excited about. Um, the New York stands for non-invasive options of dermal science, and it's really about pushing the boundaries. And Neod believes in skin health, so Neod will never have any acids, for example, because acids will give you incredible skin tomorrow. Long term, they can cause inflammation. So Neod has kind of very strong points of view on actually skin health and actually having a more long term view on the skin. Okay. Hylamide is kind of the Oh, you say hylamide. Hylamide. I, I say ilamide. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe it's the French pronunciation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so hylamide is kind of how we see almost trying to, for someone who's less interested in trying to understand the ingredients, but they still want a science results focused skincare. We think hylamide is probably the most easily accessible um, brand. The chemistry brand, as we touched on earlier, is kind of high science for the, for the hand and body. Um, so those are our four main brands. And we okay. also have Abnormally, uh, which we have just one product in at the moment. The second product's launching this year. And Abnormally is kind of our fun brand um, yeah. rather than commercial brand. But it's where we have such a creative lab team who want to look at things like a hyaluronic mouthwash. They want to look at just different random concepts. So everything like that would fall under Abnormally. Um, and then we have some new brands coming as well. So this year, Lufa will be relaunched. We have one body wash at the moment. That's our bath and body brand very yeah. fragrance driven um and then we also will be launching hippu which is our baby focused brand oh great mm. which personally very excited yeah for. <laughs> <laughs> i think so <laughs> and uh, how do you explain the the huge success of the ordinary what makes it so different to be honest, it took us by surprise. Yeah. <laughs> we always, I think if you'd asked us a few years ago, we'd have said Neod would have been our biggest brand mm. and the ordinary just, and you know, that's the thing when other brands talk about doing kind of research, market research, it's just so difficult because we never predicted the ordinary to become the success it did. And we were still blown away, pinching ourselves. I remember the early weeks with Brandon where we'd see these orders coming in and we'd be like, 
what's happening? Yeah. And, you know, we really have um, influences and, and everyone to kind of, and when I say influences, micro, macro, just everyone who really shared their story about the ordinary, shared their results, shared their love of the ingredients. I think we, I think the ordinary allowed a conversation to start because people could now start to understand skincare. They could understand ingredients, what they meant, what worked for their skin, what didn't work for their skin, and um, that we were just blown away. And I think, you know, it's, it's, impossible to ever predict anything like the ordinary so we look back and think oh maybe maybe it was this maybe it was that but I think it's just a a combination of lots of different magic but mainly just from so much love from different people um actually for the skincare category uh, and again I think the ordinary came at a time where color had been so popular for so long and then suddenly people kind of starting to have this shift so I think that kind of stars all aligned in many in many ways Mm. And um, some current indie brands clearly took inspiration from The Ordinary, from DCM and especially from The Ordinary. Uh, Brandon was a, a total visionary. He was. And I think, you know, people ask how we feel when we kind of see um, similar brands. But ultimately, Brandon wanted to change the industry. He wanted to bring more fairness, more transparency um, and when we see similar brands coming out, ultimately they're doing that as well. So it's it's a good thing, I think. We're happy mm. to have friends in the category. <laughs> and um, organic and above all, clean beauty is a huge trend at the moment. Is it something you're concerned with? I think the challenge with clean beauty is it isn't regulated. No one has a true definition of what clean means. And it can cause fear, I think, across consumers because... When you start to see a brand marketed as clean, you then assume, well, everything else must be dirty. And it isn't the case. And I think our science team are very focused on what goes into our products. And I would like to think we're kind of clean just by the fact that we focus on good ingredients. But it would never be the thing we shout about because actually I believe that our products do so much more and it's just a given for our consumers. Mm. And um, I don't know if it's the same here in England, Canada or in the US, but in France, some ingredients are very controversial, like phenoxyethanol mm. or silicones, for instance, and beauty apps are very popular to and incriminate those ingredients. Would you consider reformulating some products because of this? No. So one of our approaches always were fact-based, not trend-based. Um, so take silicones as an example. There are thousands and thousands of different silicones. There are a few that are bad for the environment and they can be damaging. But actually, there are many silicones, which are incredible ingredients. Some cost far more than even peptides. And there are a lot of benefits to using them. And, you know, it's almost when people say silicones are bad, it's like going to a bad restaurant and saying all restaurants are bad. (laughs) Mm. There might be a few that are bad, which, of course, we don't use. But actually, as a category, there's some of the great molecules that actually bring a lot of goodness to formulas. And again, this is the challenge when people start to talk about things and people pick up this trend of, well, because one brand's saying no silicones, that must mean silicones are bad. So we try and always kind of address everything with kind of fact-based. We'll follow the facts um, and we believe that's a, the better approach. Our our kind of R&D and lab team just take a very facts approach to everything and they'll never be influenced by any trends. Um, or anything that's seen as as marketing. And we kind of very much believe in always just finding the best ingredient, but then also telling the consumer everything. So kind of, um, if you go onto our website, you'll see the pH of the formula. You'll see, does it contain gluten? Does it contain nut? Is it vegan? Like all of these different elements, because that's important to the consumer. Um, So it's not that natural is good, natural is bad. It's just, let's tell, we'll make our decisions based on facts. We'll yeah. tell you the facts and then you can make your own your decision. Okay. And um, you're uh, definitely not an ordinary company. Tell us about the recycling program. So we recently just launched Terra uh, Cycle. So you can bring any be- recyclable beauty products into any of our Decium stores and we will recycle them. So it doesn't have to just be Decium products. We're happy to take any other brands. Um, so it's an initiative that we're really excited to have launched. But in honesty, I don't think as a company we're doing enough for sustainability mm. and the environment. And it's something that we're making a big focus. We're currently um, recruiting for a director of sustainability who will report directly into me. And we want to look at it across the entire business. We 
no, it's what our consumers want. It's what our team wants. It's what we should be doing. It's what everyone should be doing. Um, so I think there's a lot more we could be doing. TerraCycle's kind of a first step in the, in the right direction, but there's a lot more to come in that space. And what do you do with all the, the bottles you collect and... Uh... So TerraCycle actually mm. have the program where they okay. recycle them. Um, but I mean, ourselves, we're looking at how we can change a lot of our materials. I mean, at the moment, we use kind of glass um, for, for most of our ordinary bottles. But, you know, where we do need to use plastic, we're making sure it's recycled plastic or it's recyclable. So lots of different things we're looking into at the moment to continue in that space. Okay, great. And um, I know it's a very special time for you and the company uh, at the moment. What legacy has Brandon left to you? Brandon was an extraordinary person, but you know, he, he was incredibly kind. He cared about people. He cared about our consumers. He cared about our team. Um, so those are definitely qualities that I kind of stay strong and kind of live on. But he also just had this sense of fun. He was a big kid at heart. He just wanted to have fun, have laugh every day. Um, so he inspired so many of us and actually we're very fortunate that so many of our founding team are still in the business so he really kind of lives on in so many different elements through many different people through the products through the brands um but we as a team just have so much love for him and we're just so grateful that he he gifted us Desium. we mm. we love it to pieces and we look forward to continuing his journey And uh, what will the future bring for DCM? For new brands, new products, I imagine. Uh, but maybe, I don't know, makeup and uh, specific projects mm. uh, for France, for instance. So um, in terms of new brands, so we have Lou for coming, which is mm. the, the Bath and Body brand. So it's going to uh, be very fragrance-led. Um, the fragrance is actually Brandon picked, um, and they're just okay. incredible smells. He had an amazing nose, and I think it's probably an area where we'll really find hard to, to replace it in time but we're lucky he picked so many different ones for us to use um, and then Hippu is going to be our range which is formulated for babies but actually everyone can use it and um, so we know there's many adults out there that maybe have sensitive skin or they want to kind of use something which is very minimal in ingredients and kind of really understand those formulations uh, so really excited for those new brands to be launching and um, within France obviously excited to continue our partnerships with Galleries Lafayette with Nancy Bay with Sephora and um, we do have a very big um new department store we're launching yeah. in 2020 which i don't believe we can officially announce just yet but it's going to be okay. uh, very exciting when that happens <laughs> um, and we're looking for continuing to expand our store so i really hope 2020 might be the year that we get our own decium store in paris um but we're still just trying to find the the perfect location yeah Of course. And uh, you have huge responsibilities that make you travel all the time. Uh, how do you deal with being a married woman and a mother of a very young baby? I think firstly, having the most incredible team, because ultimately they're, they're the ones that make everything possible. And it's interesting because I actually think, you know, the way technology has evolved. I remember a few years ago, you know, it would sometimes be Hard, the fact emails never stopped. Emails would come through in the evenings. Emails would come through on, uh, on the weekends. But actually now as kind of a working mother who's trying to balance everything, I actually feel like that's a, an advantage because if I want to kind of take Mila to a play group on a Wednesday morning, I can do because maybe Wednesday evening when she's in bed, I might get my laptop out and do some emails. So actually I kind of think this kind of global company and a flexible working culture um, has really made it all possible. Mm, that's great. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Merci de nous avoir écoutés. Si ça vous a plu, abonnez-vous sur Apple Podcast et n'hésitez pas à nous laisser un avis et surtout une note. 5 étoiles, ce serait génial. Beauty Toaster est diffusé sur toutes les bonnes plateformes de podcast, sur les applis de musique à la demande et sur le blog beautytoaster.fr. Pour être informé des nouveaux épisodes, c'est facile. Ils sont annoncés sur le compte Instagram et la page Facebook de Beauty Toaster. Suivez-nous. En attendant, passez une bonne semaine et rendez-vous mercredi prochain à 7h. Mmh.